Thanks for staying with us. Now, Tinubu's certificate saga has been the subject of much debate in Nigeria with many reactions on what it means for democracy. Um, some are of the opinion that it undermines the public's trust in the electoral process. If voters believe that politicians can get away with forging certificates, they are less likely to believe that elections are fair and free. Others are concerned that certificate saga undermines Nigeria's reputation on the international stage that, and that can be perceived negatively, negatively rather, by foreign leaders and investors. Uh, meanwhile, some people believe that there's, there is nothing um, impactful about findings on the certificate saga that could affect the president's mandate. So we're asking tonight, what are your, um, what are your thoughts on this implication of the certificate, right? And uh, do you think it would impact our democracy? Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 So, um, Dami and Mary, I just want you to keep it short. Do you think it impacts? Do you think it doesn't impact? I think it does. It does? Okay. Yeah. How about you, Mary? I think it does. It would impact? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Ah, Mary. <laughs> I mean, like you rightly said, mm. for real, it's going to distrust already from the public mm. because trusting Nigerian's electoral system right now is like you're doing yourself a disservice because mm. we've seen so many things play out. Then even international relations, talk of yeah, investors. Yeah, that, yeah, I think it's, it's I going think to, for me, it's I don't more about that. any reasonable you know. person wants to invest in something that is a lie. Absolutely. Do you get so stuff like that? So this says, um, I says, what is, I, I, I typed on Google, what is the biggest threat to democracy and why? Says the enemy of democracy is not communism, nor is it socialism, nor fascism, and it's certainly not a free press. Um, not a free press. The constant and in, um, insidious threat to democracy by and for the people is corruption, plain and simple. Political corruption rots the foundation, um, foundational trust rather between the people and their leaders. On that note, let me bring in David Hudain. Um, is no stranger to the house. He's, um, David Uday is an investigative journalist and the 2023 Distinguished James Curry Fellow at the University of Cambridge Center of African Studies. He's a broadcaster whose work has appeared on CNN, The Africa Report, Al Jazeera, The Washington Post, his work um, as a satirist on the other news. Nigeria's Answer to Daily Show has featured in the New York um, New Yorker magazine and in Netflix um, documentary Larry Charles Dangerous World of Comedy and David has joined us live from somewhere around the world <laughs> Thank you so much David for joining us this evening Thank you for having me All right, so you know we had this conversation behind the scene and we were just talking and I was teasing you You said you might as well finish what you started, right? Um, this, this conversation has been long, 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 long before even the, um, what's it called, the elections. You've been doing a lot of digging, you've been doing a lot of work. You had brought out some of the first leg of the report that talked about, you know, the drug involvement of our now president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Then, of course, this now built up to certificates and all of that. And last week, we had the news where um, the PDP presidential candidate, you know, finally got the, um, what's it called, the, the, certificate, the, what's it called, the report from the Chicago State University and had a press conference, you know, because we have also held off the conversation until, you know, that report came out. And the report now comes and it checks everything out, right? Um, a lot of mixed reactions. Some have said, these things, let's let it go. Some have said, no, we have to stay on it, right? I mean, we had a conversation on Thursday last week. I mean, if you've not watched the show, you can go and watch the show. But it is a conversation of, should we, should we not? And some people say, no, let's leave it. Some people say, let's, um, what's it called? Let's stay on it and let us see it through, right? Um, so we were just thinking, really, does a certificate, a forged certificate, does it really have anything any major impact on what, I mean, governance or democracy would look like in Nigeria? Do you think it, it has that, it is that significant to make it a, a real impact? So I think the first thing to understand about um, this conversation is that the issue is not so much the certificate in itself. The certificate is important. Let's be clear about that. 
But it's not so much the certificate itself as what it represents. Mm. Now, um, there are two things that it represents. First of all, um, it implies that there is a basic level of competence, right? Obviously, having a certificate does not in itself mean that you're a competent person, but it's it's uh, generally a, a marker that is used as a proxy for some expected form of competence. And then secondly, and more importantly, the certificate signifies that the person who is presenting it has respect for the rules, because the rules clearly state that anyone who submits a forged certificate to an independent national electoral commission shall not be qualified for public office is grounds for immediate dismissal for immediate disqualification mm. so the act of presenting a forged certificate the danger that is inherent in that act is not so much the fact that having a forged certificate necessarily makes you a bad person or necessarily makes you a bad leader or necessarily um invalidates whatever ideas you might have or whatever the issue is the precedent that is being set mm. both for you and for those who will come after you and i think this is a very important thing that needs to be addressed because i think already people have started forgetting that as recently as five years ago or, or let me say eight years ago where we, we had a similar issue till today it has fallen into a memory hole but till today if you recall, it has still never been conclusively proven that the past president, Muhammad Buhari, actually had a secondary school certificate. It has still not been conclusively proven till today. If you recall, the argument that was made in court at the time was that, well, um, as long as the issuing body did not come out to categorically state that this thing is a forgery, then, well, we can't categorically say it's a forgery, so he kind of gets away with it by default. And people made similar arguments then that, well, you know, why are you making such a fuss about certificate anyway? It doesn't matter. But the thing is, he got away with it then. So here we are now, because the precedent was set that rules don't matter. The law doesn't matter. That precedent was set in 2015. It was reaffirmed in 2019. So here we are in 2023 with someone who is three or four times the con man that Muhammad Buhari was. And again, we're at that crossroads again, where again, people are making those exact same disingenuous arguments. And uh, even if it's forged, uh, so what? You people, you, you place too much importance on certificates. This, this is the problem in Nigeria. You guys place so much importance on ceremonial things. You don't deal with substance. They're always chasing shadows, blah, 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 blah. The issue is, if this person gets away with it this time, the first one was bad. This one is significantly worse because it's not just one certificate, bear in mind. It's not just the fact of submitting a forged university certificate. There are a ton of other lies that are inherent mm. in the entire declaration. But, but His entire know, background absolutely. is a lie. So let me come to you because you're saying this person is three times the con person, right? But let me say mm. this to you. In fairness, I wouldn't, um, aren't we all liars? Most of us, a good number of Nigerians are liars. You know why I say that? I mean... In the days of our mothers, they had to use somebody else's document to travel out of the country. Some people had to bring down their date of birth, you know, just to be able to fill into a role. Like, literally, right? I, I, I'm trying to be very objective here with the conversation because we too, we've been accused that everything, APC, we're always attacking. So I'm trying to create a balance here. Now, every, most Nigerians, you know, they, they rode on, um, what's it called? Um, what, would that call it forged? Or some, you know, some people will just go and declare one age. Some people will declare this, you know. Some people will say, you know what, uh, because I'm supposed to go to school this particular age, I'll bring down my years by two years. Mm. I mean, you see all sorts of things, even with certificates, right? Even with certificates. We've seen people writing exams for people. Like, literally, yeah. when it comes to the issues around falsification of results or falsification of whatever it is, I mean, it's a common practice amongst a lot of us in Nigeria, you know? So shouldn't this be like, okay, I don't know, <laughs> help me out because I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my words, but I'm saying that it's something that is already there, right? Mm -hmm. I get you saying that somebody at, the at that level of authority, but it's something that is always there. So we have, we have condoned it over the years. So what makes it seem like now anything will change or it will be different? Of course, it will continue to get worse. Which is to your point. 
So the issue is, yes, as you said, it, these things have been widespread within Nigerian society. Um, Tinubu himself didn't fall out of the sky. He obviously came from a context where such things were thought to be permissible. But the issue is, uh, first of all, Nigerians are not the only people who, are, who have a reputation for doing, for doing things like that. So as you may or may not be aware, Indians also have a very, they're also famed, even at a larger scale than Nigerians, for doing things like that. Traveling abroad, traveling abroad with other people's passports back in the days before biometric uh, uh, data capture, reducing ages, uh, claiming, you know, using false reasons to claim asylum in other countries, all sorts of things. Indians had, those, had that reputation too. But here's the thing. Who is the prime minister of India? Mm -hmm. Narendra Modi, right? Mm -hmm. You can, every step of Narendra Modi's life can be documented. You know that he went to Soa so High School. He went to Gujarat University. His mates who were there at the time, they know and can identify him. He has his papers in order. He worked at McKinsey. He doesn't just claim that he worked at McKinsey. McKinsey itself will actually confirm to you that he worked at McKinsey, which is a global top four consultancy firm, before he went into politics. And you can so the, the the point I'm trying to drive at is that regardless of how defective society is in India, the people who who sit in the topmost leadership positions there are people who can be used as models mm. of what Indians are supposed to be. Mm. Right? So they don't necessarily reflect the average Indian. That's very important in a quote unquote third world society that the people who are in power need to embody some sort of aspirational ideal for what this society wants to look like. So if in, in, in an underdeveloped or low quality society, you have leadership that is reminiscent of the bottom dregs of society, you have leadership that is reminiscent of Moto Park. What that tells the world is that this is a motor park society and that the world should never expect anything more. That this is not a developing society. This is not a society that has any intentions of getting better. This is a society that is exactly where it deserves to be and it's always going to be there. It has no intention of changing. That is what having a certificate forger and you know, a, a drug trafficker sitting in the highest office in the land does. It tells, it, it sends a message to the world that this, these are Nigerians. This is what Nigeria represents, right? It's not as if Nigeria didn't already have a very bad reputation for drug trafficking, for document forgery, uh, 419 scam. Nigeria already had that reputation since the 70s. But the thing is, it, it hasn't really happened before that someone at the very highest level has been directly implicated in those things. That's always been possible to at least pretend that the Nigerian government um, is not on board with those things, you know, even though that wasn't always true, but at least you could pretend. Now, for the first time, you are basically having MC Oluomo as your president mm -hmm. because they come from the same stratum of, of society, right? You are basically having MC Oluomo as your president. The message that is sending to the world is that this is the level of Nigerian society. So even those of us who think of ourselves as middle class, and well educated, upwardly mobile, global citizens, whatever, um, the fact that we come from Nigeria doesn't mean that we have to be tied to a certain way of doing things. We've seen the world, we're exposed. We are still going to be judged through those lens. Mm. That's the problem. Mm. That's the issue. So regardless of whether I'm in Nigeria or not, regardless of, what, regardless of whether my children will grow up in Nigeria or not, regardless of whether I earn an income from Nigeria or not, regardless of whether I use a Nigerian passport or not, I will always be judged through the lens of the person who is perceived to embody Nigeria. Nobody embodies Nigeria more than the person who is the head of state. That is the issue. Hmm. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if we just tuned in, we're having the conversation around um, the Tinubu Certificate Saga, and we're asking what are its implications on democracy, and we have with us David Houdain. Now, please... Let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 Then we have a question, right? Okay, yes. So, um, David, I mean, I quite understand that this entire certificate saga has a major impact on the democracy of Nigeria. I mean, trust and whatnot. But then again, uh, I'm also aware that Nigeria is not the most corrupt nation, right? So we have nations that are, I believe, are a lot more corrupt than Nigeria. But are we saying that we, 
particularly need a good person to lead us as a nation or we just need someone with the capacity because i mean we can say our pres our current president is a lot of things quite frankly but then again in terms of capacity don't you think that he he's literally the man for for the job excluding every of his excesses i don't know if you understand my question hmm. i like my fundamentally on an integrity oh. with that point of view. First of all, um, the vision of the president is just as important as the alleged capacity of the president. The presidency is not just a functional one, it's also a ceremonial one. It also sends a message to the world. So, for example, um, Colombia, in the days of Pablo Escobar, you could have made a similar argument that Pablo Escobar, I mean, he ran the world's most prominent criminal station. So clearly, he had a lot of high quality managerial capacity. At his peak, Pablo Escobar probably had more accountants working for him than KPMG did. So you could have made that argument that Pablo Escobar would make a good Colombian president. This man who has managerial capacity can run an economy. Mm. There's a reason why Colombians rejected that idea so very mm. even. So now that we have a Nigerian Pablo Escobar, I think that would be a very mistaken argument to make. And then Oh, wow. Conversations that we've already had a hundred times in the lead up to the elections, but examining every um, every bit of the timeline of this character's political story, it becomes very clear that the supposed capacity or achievements, everything that has been built up is one huge media creation. Mm. Because if, for example, from his time as governor, as the the um, the CEO, if you like, of Lagos State. What was his calling card? His primary policy throughout his eight years in Lagos State was that he brought organized crime into the fabric of the Lagos State government. He turned the so-called hardware roads into a semi-official part of the tax collection um, uh, infrastructure of Lagos State. So in other words, the official tax collection capacity of Lagos was not really improved. Instead, he empowered those people who go around tearing tickets for bus conductors and turned them into something much more powerful than they already were and gave them executive power so that now you have people like MC Oluomo having police escorts. Right? MC Oluomo has more rights to protection as a Nigerian citizen than you do. MC Oluomo is a criminal, you are not. Mm. Right? But MC Oluomo has more say in Nigeria than you do. That's a tenable legacy. So if that's the capacity that you're referring to, then I mean, I really beg to differ, right? There is no evidence of this supposed capacity that people always talk about. Beyond the media creation, obviously he is someone who has always been very, very aware of the importance of press and the importance of PR. And he is someone who has been able to, even his most strident media critics, people like Bayo Anonga, who, in case you've forgotten, was the, one of the very first journalists in Nigeria to actually break the story about Tinebu's certificate forgery back in 1998. Mm. That's in Bayo over time, has been co-opted into the Tinubu machinery now because that's the kind of person Tinubu is. He knows how to entrap people with money. Mm. So that's the capacity. So beyond that, I have no idea what this capacity is that people are always referring to. I mean, I would know because I was born and raised in Lagos. I'm from Lagos. Like, I saw this up close. Mm. You know, my dad used to work in civil service. This is someone that I know personally. So this idea that, oh, he's some kind of competent leader, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I've never bought it. I've never seen the evidence for it. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, these are strong words, you know, say criminal, criminal, criminal. Uh, but I was going to ask you, David, right? Um, we are here now. You saw the events that happened with the um, tribunal, right? And of course, there has been some appeal to the Supreme Court to say, okay, um, presenting some of these things. And I think this was why it was really important for, I think, the uh, PDP candidate to get that certificate um, just to prove that all the things, because, I mean, this was part of what was given to INEC to say this was a grounds for disqualification and all of that, right? But we saw how the tribunal, th I mean, threw all the cases out. Mm -hmm. The best way for a democracy to, um, to survive in any economy or any country is also that they have a very strong judicial system, right, that upholds whatever it is that they are supposed to uphold based on 
um, the facts based on truth and all of those things. But you, Nigeria is a unique um, terrain, you know. Uh, so how do you see this um, new certificate release, right, or the, the uh, what's it called, the report from Chicago State University, how do you see this impacting the appeal, I mean, sorry, the Supreme Court's um, judgment? Do you think it will make any impact or we're just going to be running around in circles? Um, in, in a country with a functioning judiciary, it definitely would make an impact. I mean, if, in a country with a functioning judiciary, Timbo wouldn't even have, have made it this far. You know, I've been disqualified since November last year when I put the story out and when this was taken to court. Because lest we forget, this was actually taken to the FCT High Court back in, in November last year. And the Nigerian justice system did what it does. All the judges ran away from the case. No judge was assigned to it. And it basically timed out. So it became statute barred. Right? So that's what the Nigerian justice system does. So in a functioning, in a country with a functioning judiciary, yes, it absolutely would have an impact if Timingu had even got this far. By now, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. It would be a, a done deal. If this, if this were the US, and he had somehow managed to make it all the way to the presidency, and then afterwards it became clear that he had told a lie about his background. He, we wouldn't even be talking about the Supreme Court. The, the, the articles for impeachment would have already been passed mm. in the House by now. Mm. But Nigeria is not that place. We know Nigeria is a place where the appeal courts uh, judgment, the appeal court uh, chief justice delivered a judgment saying that, um, yes, uh, somebody had a double nomination, but he didn't do it intentionally, so it doesn't count. You know, mm -hmm. the, that, uh, to my, the best of my knowledge, that's the first time I've ever heard in any court of law anywhere on the planet, including North Korea, that ignorance is an excuse under the law. You know, very, you know, a, a, a judicial first. So, that's the kind of justice system we have in Nigeria. Those are the kind of judges we have in Nigeria. And then the Supreme Court itself is, to a large extent, staffed by people who are openly loyal to them, such as Chief Justice Kaide Ariwala. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, what I will say is that it will depend almost 100% on how Nigerians choose to respond to it. Because as I said earlier to me on a different platform, Nigeria is not a country that functions based on rules and laws and set processes. Nigeria is a country that functions on vibes, emotions, noise, and narrative. That's how Nigeria works, unfortunately. So I can tell you for a fact that the appeal court judgment which was delivered, if there had been a different public reaction, even on the morning that the judgment were to be delivered, the judgment that would, that would have been delivered would have been different. I'm telling you that categorically. Right? Nigeria is a country where these things matter. Regardless of whatever statement that the Chief Justice came out and put out last week that you shouldn't take public opinion into account, and blah, 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 blah. The truth is that public opinion absolutely does count for a lot. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So it's Nigerians themselves who decide whether they are going to, with their silence, acquiesce with being insulted the way they were insulted by the appeal court ruling, or if they are not going to accept it this time around. Because I think it's very clear cut, right, that even a, a, a competent court in the U.S., like a, lawyers acting under the jurisdiction of the courts in the U.S. have established that forgery has taken place. So it's no longer a case of, oh, has this thing been proven in court? It has been proven in court, in an even higher quality court than, in, than, than any Nigerian court. So at this point, it's no longer a case of anybody waiting for the Supreme Court to make any judgment or not. At this point, people know what has happened, two plus two is definitely four, regardless of what the Supreme Court chooses to say. So now it's up to people to decide whether they're going to let the Supreme Court do what it wants to do. We all know what the Supreme Court wants to do. The Supreme Court wants to find a technicality, throw it out, mm -hmm. and keep Tinubu in office, because the people in the panel are loyal to Tinubu. That's just how Nigeria works. Yeah. So it's up to the Nigerian people themselves to decide if they're going to let it happen or if they're tired. And if, if, unfortunately, if the Nigerian people aren't tired yet, if they are okay with being, with having their intelligence insulted by a tiny group of people, then, you know, I, I guess all the work that people like us have put in over the past few years would have been for nothing, which I guess is a shame, but ultimately, mm. it is what it is. Yeah. Okay, so considering all you said now, David, what would you rather have the people of Nigeria do? I'm asking this question because we are very aware that we have a system that works against us. So no matter how much we, you know, protest, carry placards, 
say this, say that, both online and offline. It feels like nothing is being done because there are powers above that just won't let it get done. So what would you rather have the citizens of Nigeria do in a case like this? Because we are very aware also that when it gets to the Supreme Court, we can only hope for the best, but in our minds, we feel like we know what the result is going to be like. Do you get what I'm saying? So what would you really have us do? Yeah. So the thing is, um, if you recall, sometime in I think it was twenty eighteen. I don't know, I don't know if you remember a police PR. I think his name was Abayo Michogun, mm -hmm. who used to be very cantankerous on social media. Mm. He used to be openly, you know, there was I there, there's this particular incident that I cannot forget, where if you recall, NSARS had been a hashtag since maybe 20, late twenty seventeen or so. Yeah. And one of those times where it flared up briefly, sometime in twenty eighteen. Abel Mishra Wille went to Twitter and said uh, 85 million retweets to end start. He was openly mocking people who were complaining about their pain that they had suffered in the hands of the special anti robbery squad. He went to Twitter and said 85 million retweets to end start, and then he put laughing emojis, right? And then, like less than three years later, all of a sudden, nobody knew what happened. Nobody organized anything. Nobody told anybody what to do. All of a sudden, answers went from just being some random internet hashtag into becoming something that literally brought the country to a halt. And then you had the then president going on TV and making an announcement that the special anti robbery squad has been disbanded. Now, whether or not it was actually disbanded in the functional sense, that's another conversation altogether. But the point is, the, at the, the one time when Nigerians decided that they were actually tired of something, nobody made any recommendation to them to tell them what to do. Nobody organized any movement for them to join. Nobody did anything. It just happened. Hmm. Because when Nigerians are tired of things, nobody tells them what to do. So if I have to sit down and recommend any course of action, then from experience, that means that Nigerians are not ready. We're not ready. Because when Nigerians are ready, they know what they did. Well, we saw what happened with yeah. <laughs> let I mean, let's take a break. Someone says, hello, I'm watching your program, and I, I'm honestly, I'm disappointed with how you guys allow that young boy um, calling our president unprintable names and no respect. You guys watch and condole all the trash he's talking about without evidences. Please, let's respect our president. It's so sad. Journalism has gone to the gutters. Oga? He says it's just been emotional. <laughs> it's not been um, I had this. Comment there. Yeah, this is all yeah. seen from Delta. For me, your guest has said it all. When a bad precedence is set, and people, especially those occupying leadership positions, who should lead by example? Mm -hmm. What do you expect? Till today, Buhari's certificate matter was swept under the carpet. And who I saying she is being careful because APC are always angry because the truth is said. I really weep for, for this country, for your information. The damage about this saga will, will impact negatively on Nigeria. Hmm. That is sad. Okay, good evening. I am shocked at what the anchor said regarding the conversation on President Tinubu's alleged um, certificate forgery. Even though we have issues of fraud and document forgery in the country, we shouldn't use that as an excuse to this issue. This is a shame if indeed the certificate is fake. This is bad without an excuse. Let's call a spade a spade. Um, I don't know if it's from the same person, mm -hmm. but we've got rules, and if we don't follow the rules, then whatever we do will be a joke. No development will come as a result. So says, good evening, ladies. Um, David nailed his argument perfect. The Nigerians debating a no... Um, debating a no-brainer issue like this forged certificate, like, like this forged certificate issue of the president shows how low we have sunk mm. as a country as per dysfunctional societal values. It will be the most dangerous precedent in Nigeria. Unfortunately, Nigeria lacks a critical mass of patriotic leaders loyal to Nigeria and the constitution above any individual who normally should have done the needful. How did we get here in Nigeria? This is Ni from um, uh, Omole, Lagos. Thank you, Ni. Um, David, I mean, you see the thing. We've not even finished. They're already attacking us. The so NBC <laughs> should watch this. I mean, so this conversation, you started this investigation. And I must commend your work because, again, a lot of people, um, 
some people don't argue don't agree with your methods i remember some journalists sending me some videos of the clip that you just really recently released you know a video and i said see it, it's his style you need to understand that some people would go the extra mile to do that you know people have questioned what's your motive what is this what is that right um, I don't believe you have a motive, but some people would argue otherwise that you have a motive behind all of these things. But it's, I mean, it's an argument that is really not at, at the critical um, point right now. Where do we move from here? We have all of these problems. We don't know what to do. Nigerians are like kind of like stuck. Um, like you rightly said, President Buhari's um, certificate was questionable. Now we've even seen a much more bigger problem. So what gives that tomorrow is not even going to get worse? Because now, what they've just told me is that even me, even I, can forge <laughs> a certificate. <laughs> I mean, Kenny Ode Oshun, was it a, a, um, her NYSE stuff? The mm -hmm. saga yeah, that yeah, yeah. everybody went all over yeah. her. She had to resign. and then, I mean, because she even had integrity. Because she just resigned JJJ yeah, and left yeah. the thing and went back to uh, her UK. I mean, we've seen some people being torn apart for even a little... A, something much more minute mm -hmm. than this. So what is the real reason behind this? You know, is it that the power is just so big, so strong that nobody can say, guy, I love you, but this one is wrong. You know, is it, I mean, how do we move from here? Because this is where we say we do not have, we can't keep having a center that is so powerful that we don't have other bodies that are supposed to checkmate that center. Mm -hmm. So part of the issue here is that um, the person, the individual in question, uh, uh, who has spent years, if not decades, um, planning his move to the presidency. And part of that strategic plan has been um, curring favors where necessary, um, putting people in his debt, placing people in strategic positions. So for example, um, Kaede Arreola of the Supreme Court owes his position as CJN to Tinubu's lobby. I'm saying that as a statement, as a categorical statement of fact. Right? Anyone who wants to deny it, should feel free to deny it. That's a fact. Tinubu, um, while I, I guess most of us in Nigeria are quite, you know, relatively young, the median age of Nigeria is between 18 and 19. But Tinubu is a very old man. Old men think in decades, while people like us think in months and single years, right? So he has actually pro probably foreseen a lot of the resistance that might have come to the idea of a Tinubu presidency. And he spent years setting a lot of dominoes in motion. Even the decision to back Buhari in 2015 mm. was part of that domino sequence that yeah. when you create a precedent of the worst candidate on the ballot winning the election, it then is gonna happen again. It happened in 2015, it happened in 2019. So why shouldn't it happen in 2023 and beyond, right? So in that sense, you have to give it to him in a Nigerian political sense. Um, he is, he's very strategic. Mm. The problem with that is that there are lots of people, including people that... Oh, take your comments quickly. Uh, Sorry, David, we lost you. ...foreseen that potentially could be roadblocks to his ambition, and mm. he has put things in so place to either buy them... just positioned everybody from a very yeah. long time ago. Yeah. All right, David. Or we... neutralize them. So <sighs> basically, the issue now is, as one of your, your, your listeners just said, um, there's there's a critical deficit of people with influence in Nigeria now yeah. who are actually prepared to put the country mm. over the individual. Mm. So it's now a case of the entire Nigerian government is now being monopolized mm. by a single individual. Wow. I don't think people realize how dangerous this is. It's not a matter of Tinubu being president for eight years or four years. That's not the issue. The issue is that what Nigeria was supposedly running away from in 1998, after Abacha died, is exactly what we're about to get into now, mm. right? The entire reason why PDP was created, the rotational power principle was created, all those things was to prevent any single individual from becoming as powerful as Abacha was mm. ever again. Mm. That is exactly what, what is, is happening, happening now. now yeah. wow. But instead of, using, instead of doing it by the butt of a gun, mm. he's doing it using money and using people, influence. Yeah. So I guess people don't realize how dangerous it is. It's not a case of whether Tinubu is a, is a good person or a bad person. Mm. It's a case of a, what you are having, what is building up in front of us mm. is a one-party state. It's mm. a dictatorship. 
-hmm. But because it's not wearing military uniform and, and holding a gun, people mm -hmm. don't seem to realize how dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, David. I think that's a fantastic way to wrap the conversation. We'll definitely have to bring you back as much as we can. We'll keep having this conversation. I'm sorry we can't take more comments. We heard that there's so much more comments, but we can't take it. President, Tinubu's certificate saga and the issue surrounding it is a huge embarrassment that definitely rubs off on national integrity. This was from Chief Festus Oguche. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen.